Well, hello guys. Uh, so this is Mr. Gruber. I am going to be covering some algebra skills today um, that I feel like are worthwhile to go over and just go through some examples. Um, so we're going to be covering two different things. We're going to talk about laws of exponents, um, both for integer and rational exponents. They are the same, as well as radical form. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the laws of exponents. And again, the style of this video is we're just going to go through some practice to kind of cover all these different rules and laws. Okay. So you can follow along with me. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do the following problem. Okay. If at any point you want to pause the video and try the problem on your own and then see how you do, uh, on your own and then see if you can get the same answer that I do. That would be a good idea. So here we have uh, two different things that we're multiplying. Just to point out a couple things here, notice that I have two different numbers and then I have like bases. And since I'm multiplying these like bases, um, I'm going to be adding their exponents, okay? So that's one of the key laws of exponents, whether it's a fraction, in other words, a rational number or uh, an integer. So to get started, we can first right away multiply 2 and negative 3. So we know that that gives us negative 6, right? And then if I kind of do a little side problem here and just make a note of what is 5 halves plus 1 fourth, again, we're adding those exponents because I'm multiplying like bases, right? They both are an x. So to get these to be able to... Um, be in the form of addition, I need to have a common denominator. So the LCD or the least common denominator of two and four is two. That's the smallest number that both two and four divide evenly into. So I'm gonna multiply this first fraction by two over two. You have to do it in the top and bottom. Um, essentially you're multiplying by one, so you're not really changing the problem, you're just changing how it looks, right? So from this step, two times five is 10, two times two is four. And now if you look, I'm in a good spot to add the fractions because I have a common denominator. So that is what's going to go up here as my exponent for the base of x. Okay, so pretty straightforward problem. If you're multiplying and you have like bases, you add the exponents, which we did that work down here. And then the numbers you just multiply like normal. Okay, so that's our first problem. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to another problem here. And let's see if I can there we go. Um, so for number two, we're going to talk about division. The last problem we talked about multiplication, so it makes sense to talk about a division problem. Okay. So let's take a look at something like this. So we got a lot going on here. First of all, again, we have division. We have like bases of x that we're dividing. We have like bases of y's we're dividing. So in the previous problem, if we go back here, remember multiplication of like bases, we add the exponents. So you can probably guess that for division, I'm going to subtract the exponents of like bases. So first off, we know that 7 divided by 14 is uh, 1 half. So I'm going to put a 1 half here. Okay. And then for the x's, because I'm dividing x's, dividing two things that have a base of x, I'm going to subtract these exponents. Now notice here that there's no exponent, but secretly there's an exponent of 1. So for the x's, 2 minus 1 would result in uh, x to the power of 1, right? And for the y, same thing. We have like bases of y, so I'm going to subtract the exponents because I'm dividing here. So 5 minus negative 12. Be careful with that. It's a double negative. 5 minus negative 12 is y to the 17th, right? And then just to kind of make it a little bit cleaner, we don't necessarily have to have this one here. It's understood that there's a leading coefficient of one there, so we can write it as follows. Okay, so there is our answer there, okay? Um, so again, for the division, we had to make sure we did subtraction. The last problem we did multiplication of like bases, you add the exponents, okay? Um, and so let's talk about another law that comes into play pretty frequently, okay, which is something that looks like this. So this we're going to call 
our uh, power to a power law. Okay. So if you hear the power to a power law, that's what this is referring to. So the reason it's called a power to a power is because I have powers inside, but I'm raising those to another power. So one thing you want to remember here is in the first problem, when I was multiplying like bases, I added the exponents. That is different than this problem where I am raising a power to another power. Sometimes uh, I see a lot of students get confused with that. So just make sure you keep those laws separate. Um, so the way I'm going to handle this one is, first of all, because I have a negative exponent, I want to make that positive. That's kind of a common uh, standard that you'll see. And in order to make that positive, I just take everything uh, and move it to the bottom of the fraction. Okay. And I'm going to leave everything the way it is so far. And now it becomes a positive three. Now, if this was one, like if it was one over all of this, I would take this and it would now be up top, right? So in other words, if you have a negative exponent, if it's in the bottom, it goes to the top. If it's in the top, it goes to the bottom. Okay. But that's actually not our power to power law. We were just using our negative exponent law there. The power to a power law comes in when I do something like this. So I'm going to take this power of 3 and apply it to every piece inside the parentheses. Now notice again that 3 actually has a power of 1, x clearly has a power of 2, and y has a power of 1. So it's kind of like the distributive property for powers. So I'm going to do 3 times 1, the exponent here, 3 times 2, the exponent here, and 3 times 1, the exponent for y there. So writing that out, we have the following. 2 times 3 is 6, y to the third. So again, I took this power of 3, I applied it to each exponent inside, remembering that if I don't see an exponent, there's an exponent of 1. And then to finish it off, I have 1 over 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3 is 27, x to the sixth, y to the third. Okay, so there's our, our third problem. Uh, so we've gone through multiplying like bases, dividing like bases, negative exponent law, um, power to a power law. There are a couple other ones you want to keep in mind. For example, anything raised to the power of zero except zero itself. It's a little bit more of a tricky concept uh, is one. So for example, 10 to the power of zero is one, x to the power of zero is one and so on. Okay, um, but those are some of the more common laws that you'll see. Um, and now we're going to kind of switch gears and we're going to talk about radical form. Okay, so radical form, if you're not familiar with radical form, is when you have something that looks like this. Sometimes different textbooks use different letters here, or they'll switch the A and the B. The point is that you have uh, a couple pieces here. You have the, first of all, the radical sign. You have the, um, what's called the radicand. That's what's the inside part. Okay. And then you have your usually what's called your, your root. Um, also no, uh, you can also call it your index or your indice. Um, and so those are kind of the, the general parts, but this would be something that shows up like the square root of four or the square root of 10, whatever the cubed root, the fourth root, whatever root you want to do. Um, so one thing that we want to keep in mind here is that, uh, if we want to go to exponent form, which is what we just did in the last three problems, all of those were in exponent form, right? There is a way to do that. And let me actually just kind of connect these a little bit better. So the way that you can do that is if I have the eighth root of x to the b or the b root of x to the a, whatever way you write it. I'm using the format that I used here as a is the root and b is the power. Um, this would become x to the b over a. Okay. If I wanted to convert it to exponent form. 
So just a couple of things going on here. The way that I remember this, and I've, I've heard other teachers and students teach this to me as a cool saying to use is the power or the, uh, yeah, the power is in the flower, right? So if you think about this as like your flower and this is the root of the flower, the power is in the flower, right? It stays up top where the flower would be, whereas the root of the flower stays in the bottom because it's a root, right? So that would be your, your conversion, okay? Um, so we're going to use that in the next couple problems. So for this fourth problem, we're going to do the square root of 16 x to the fourth y cubed. Okay. Um, so for a lot of these radical form, again, we have the radical sign here. A lot of the radical form problems, what you're going to want to do is uh, convert it to exponent form. So if I think about the relationship between these two, here the root is actually 2, right? When you see this and there's no number, you assume it's a 2. It's a square root. That's understood. So there's really a 2 here. And then um, if I use these as my kind of powers and my radicand, uh, this is what the result would look like if I wrote it in exponent form. Right? So you can kind of imagine, like, I could write, I'll erase this in a second, but I could write this whole thing as the power of 1, and then comparing it to this form, b is the power of 1, a is root 2. So the power goes to the flower, the root goes to the root. So all of this is the same thing as uh, raising it to the 1 half. And let me just undo that just so it's not confusing. Okay, so that would be your conversion to exponent form. And then what you can do here is you can actually use the laws that we discussed on the previous problem. And now if you look, what I have is a power to a power problem, just like we did in this problem right here, right? The power to a power. So we can write this as 16 to the power of 1 half, right? Again, kind of like the distributive property of powers. So power of 1 times 1 half, power of 4 times 1 half. Well, 4 times 1 half is 2. And then here, 3 times 1 half, I'm just going to leave that as 3 halves, right? That doesn't simplify. 3 times 1 half is 3 halves. So you have this. And then noting that we know that this means the square root of 16, if I convert it back to radical form, well, the square root of 16 we know is 4. So in the end, I have this. Okay, 4x squared, y to the 3 halves. Okay, so there's number 4. Let's go ahead and keep moving on here with number 5. Okay. Number five, we're just going to look at a number, so the square root of 40. So first of all, the square root of 40 is not an integer answer. It's a decimal. Um, but what we can do here is we can use two other laws. I'll call these the laws of radicals. Okay. And those say that the square root of x times the square root of y is equal to the square root of x times y. And square root of x divided by square root of y is equal to the square root of x over y. Okay, um, So we're going to use these to help us out. And actually, I'd encourage you to go back and prove why are these true using laws of exponents. So these are not just random laws. They are very much connected, directly connected to the laws of exponents. So using this, um, what I want to do is think about what are some factors of 40 that are perfect squares. Perfect squares being like 1, 4, 9, 16, right? 36, 25. I skipped over that one. So if I think about that, I can write 40 as the square root of 4 times 10. Right? Now, the reason I picked those two numbers, square root of 40 is also 2 times 20, right? I could have done that one. But the reason I picked specifically 4 and 10 is because I know that the square root of 4 is an integer, right? It's a what I like to kind of informally call a nice number. And now using this law down here, I can go both ways. So I can separate this into 2, which applying that to this problem looks like this. And then we know the square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 10 does not simplify, right? Even if you try and do this again, you could say, okay, well, 10 is 2 times 5, neither 2 nor 5 is a uh, perfect square, right? So that would be another um, another way of writing 
square root of 40 as, you could write it as 2 times the square root of 10, which is kind of a, a neat thing to think about, that if you go into your calculator and you write this or this, it'll give you the same number, okay? All right, so you can, there's a, you can kind of come up with your own problems like that. Um, I'd encourage you to do that, to kind of practice with that here. All right, and now we are on number six. So number six, we're going to talk about adding radicals. Okay, now the biggest thing is keeping, uh, let me see here, keeping this law here, okay, separate from addition. It may be extremely tempting at first glance to say that this is equal to the square root of 8 plus 32, which is the square root of 40, right? But that is not true, okay? Um, you can even prove it to yourself. If you do in your calculator square root of 8 plus the square root of 32, and then you do the square root of 40, you'll see that they are not equal, okay? Um, but what I can do is I can kind of use the type of problem we just did and simplify the square root of 8 and 2, or excuse me, the square root of 8 and the square root of 32 into something a little bit simpler that maybe I can combine. So just bear with me, and I think this will make sense. So I'm going to write the square root of 8 as 4, square root of 4 times 2, again, because I know 4 is a perfect square. And I'm going to write the square root of 32 as the square root of 16 times 2, because I know that 16 is a perfect square. I'm going to use that law we just talked about on the previous page, because I have multiplication here, right? And I'm going to do it to both of these. And so the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 2 we can't simplify, the square root of 16 is 4, the square root of 2 we can't simplify. And now once we get to this point, as long as what's under the square root, the radicand, or the cubed root, or whatever nth root you're talking about, as long as these numbers are the same, and they have the same root, so these are both square roots, they're both 2s as a radicand, I can combine these. So this means here I have... If you just say it to yourself, I have two root twos, and then I'm adding four more root twos. So in total, I have six root twos. Okay, and again, the square root of two can't be simplified. So there's a a simplified version of the square root of eight plus the square root of thirty-two. Okay, and again, you can kind of come up with your own problems too to to practice these. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, all right, and then our last problem here is we're going to use a division. So we're going to go back to uh, we did this guy here. Now we're going to look at this guy here. We kind of did a separate problem here just to kind of identify the difference in types of problems. But number seven, we're going to do the square root of 28 over the, write that a little nicer, the square root of 28 over the square root of seven. So first of all, neither of these are perfect squares. So at first glance, it may look a little bit complicated, right? The, the square root of 28 is not an integer. The square root of seven is not but what I can do again, by the law we said on the previous page, is I can combine them together under one square root symbol. And then what is 28 divided by 7? Well, it's, a, it's 4, and I know that the square root of 4 is 2. Okay, So again, using all these laws um, really kind of simplifies these problems. right? We kind of had two sets. We had these laws of radicals, if you want to call them that. And then we had our laws of exponents and the conversion between the two and all these different problems, right? Um, so I'd encourage you to go back, maybe come up with some problems of your own to work through a lot of these, and just uh, kind of get familiar with converting between exponent and radical form and using other laws. So I hope this video was helpful to you. Feel free to subscribe to the page if you want to be updated with any other um, algebra videos I do in the future or other math topics, and thanks for watching.